We are the University of Waterloo, and we are built for change. We are researchers united across disciplines and entrepreneurs advancing innovations. We are students working together to challenge the status quo, where leaders connect to the best and brightest talent. We are a global community who drive meaningful, sustainable, economic and social solutions. Through the power of partnership, we unlock new possibilities to transform ideas to inventions, curiosity to action, and imagination to impact. We don't fear the unknown. We thrive on opportunity to create, explore, and push boundaries. We are the University of Waterloo where collaboration drives the greatest impact. Let's build the future together. Well, hello, and welcome to the 28th TD Walter Bean Public Lecture being held for the first time virtually from Waterloo, Ontario, Canada. My name is Jean Andre, and I'm the Dean of the Faculty of Environment and also the Chair of the Sustainable Development Solutions Network Canadian Chapter that's hosted here at the University of Waterloo. I would like to begin by publicly acknowledging the history of the land that the University of Waterloo is situated on. The Waterloo, Kitchener and Cambridge campuses of the University are on the Haldeman Tract land that was promised to the Six Nations of the Grand River, land within the territory of the Neutral, Anishinaabe, and Haudenosaunee peoples. Our ability to work and live here now in Waterloo Region is tied to policies of expulsion and assimilation of Indigenous peoples during the time of settlement and confederation and since. We have a responsibility to acknowledge and understand this history and the current experiences of First Nations, Inuit and Métis peoples, and for this understanding to inform the work that we do. I am a fifth generation Canadian and my ancestors were farmers from Southwest Germany who benefited from land grants along the Allura Road in the mid 19th century as European settlement moved into the County of Bruce. My grandparents and parents met some of the displaced indigenous peoples and often reflected that their own gain and in turn mine and that of my children and grandchildren was at the expense of Indigenous peoples. We are hosting the event tonight as a community that is committed to working toward the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals and to learning from and working with Indigenous peoples along this journey. Well, I truly want to welcome all of our attendees, students, faculty, staff, friends, industry and community partners. I know that you're here from around the globe. We have people from Dubai and India, from New Zealand, from across America and, and Canada as well. Did you know that there are 200,000 Waterloo alumni worldwide? Some of who of course are joining us tonight. We at the Faculty of Environment are delighted that we were able to partner with our colleagues in all of the other faculties, the faculties of arts, engineering, health, math, and science to put this together. Now, typically we, we would have gathered together in Hagee Hall on the University of Waterloo's main campus. But perhaps the silver lining is that for, by providing this event virtually, many more of you can attend. I do not believe that even half of the registered participants would have fit into Hagee Hall. We had more than 1200 people register and we know that many others are joining through the snowball invitations that have been going out because everyone is keen to hear what our guest um, speaker will say tonight. For nearly 30 years, the TD Walter Bean Professorship in Environment has attracted top international expertise on the environment and sustainability to our campus. Describing as a fitting testament to the late Walter Bean's legacy of community involvement and commitment to youth and education, the TD professorship is made possible thanks to the generosity of TD Canada Trust 
and their commitment to building a sustainable future together with partners. I'm now delighted to introduce our president, Dr. Feridun Hamdalapur, who has been a champion of sustainability throughout his tenure at Waterloo. Feridun. Thank you very much, Jean, and good evening, everybody. Jean, uh, from last time you counted, we, uh, we've, we've grown to 210,000 strong alumni, so, and uh, uh, we'll keep growing because we make a big difference, not just here in Canada, but around the world, our graduates. Uh, but let me take this opportunity to welcome our community members, as you said, uh, who are with us this evening and look forward to hearing our guest speaker and also thank our partner um, uh, and welcome uh, members of TD, uh, our friends and colleagues to our virtual campus. As you said, for almost 40 years, the University of Waterloo and TD partner in building a better sustainable world for everybody. This is an exemplary partnership and on behalf of the entire university, let me again express my big thanks to TD and I hope that our partnership will continue growing and uh, go forward for many more years. The University of Waterloo is truly committed to all aspects of sustainability, but you could see a great example of this. We weren't just talking about it, we wanted to make it happen. And we have a standalone, we're one of a few universities that has a standalone faculty of environment. While environmental sustainability is an extremely important uh, uh, strategic objective for us, we are also very much equally committed to uh, social sustainability as well as economic sustainability. We believe that at the University of Waterloo, we are deeply committed to the highest level of scholarship and excellence, but at the same time, prosperity of our nation and prosperity around the world is also important, but we cannot even begin to imagine this without all aspects of sustainability. Like many of you, I am absolutely looking forward to hearing our guest speaker, the lecture today, as the topic is so unbelievably important, not just for today, but for generations to come. But many important conversations will have to happen today. As I'm speaking, I'm also anxious that, are we too late? We're not because I think we have a very deep understanding of this. And we have our government partners, colleagues, friends with us, supporting the university, supporting our objectives. So with that one, I'm delighted to welcome uh, our uh, Minister of uh, uh, Diversity and Inclusion, uh, Honorable Bardish Chagar, uh, Inclusion and Youth, I'm sorry, uh, Minister uh, uh, Bardish Chagar with us, and also Anna Yacobelli, Senior Vice President, uh, Metro West Region at TD joining us. Thank you so much again for being with us. And it's, it's my great pleasure to invite our minister uh, uh, to, uh, and then Ms. Jacobelli uh, to share some remarks with us. With that, thank you so much again. Thank you, Dr. Hamdulapur. Um, hello, and thank you so much for having me for the TD Walter Bean Virtual Public Lecture. I am pleased to join you from my home in the city of Waterloo. COVID-19 has impacted the world, all Canadians and disproportionately certain segments. This pandemic has shed light on the inequities that exist within our society. As we continue to address the challenges of today and the impacts of this global pandemic, the government of Canada remains focused on meeting the tests of the future. Climate change is the biggest long-term threat of our generation, but it is also the greatest economic opportunity. Since our government took office in 2015, we have been clear. We will not choose between protecting the environment and supporting the economy. We must do both. In December, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau announced our strengthened climate plan to protect the environment, fight climate change, support communities, and create jobs in an economy that's more sustainable and more resilient. Our government has taken a whole of government approach, meaning we're breaking down the silos that have existed for far too long for the environment and the economy to go hand in hand and for them to work for all Canadians, we must work together even better. 
We must ensure we are informed by science. Frankly speaking, we don't know what we don't know, and the mind is curious. That is why opportunities like tonight are so exciting as they feed the mind and broaden our horizons. As Minister of Diversity and Inclusion in Youth, I need my colleagues to consider my mandate responsibilities just as each cabinet minister must consider the additional responsibilities of those around them when making decisions. This should be the case everywhere. We work for each other. We work for a stronger economy. We work for a stronger environment and we work for all Canadians. One way to ensure we are moving in the same direction is through partnerships. The TD Walter Bean Professorship in Environment allows the University of Waterloo to invite some of the world's greatest researchers. I'm looking forward to hearing from Dr. Edgeman tonight, as well as to the fireside chat with Dr. Janice Berry following the public lecture. As we rebuild our economy, we are committed to building back even better, smarter, and consciously more inclusive. Our government is committed to evidence-based decision-making, a foundation within me for my time at the University of Waterloo. Two things before I close. First, thank you to Dr. Hamdulapur, to Dean Andre, the University of Waterloo, TD, the team who put this together and to all participating. I often say as much as the world needs more Canada, Canada needs more Waterloo. And Waterloo, our best natural renewable resource is our people. People from around the world and across the country choose Waterloo. In Waterloo, we bring people together. And since we cannot in person right now, we embrace technology and we gather virtually. Secondly, we know it's been tough and your anxieties are real. Our government is committed to seeing you through to the other side of this pandemic. If you haven't, check out the Wellness Together Canada portal and download the COVID Alert 19 app. And please follow public health guidelines. Wash your hands, wear your mask when you cannot keep six feet distance from others. So keep well and safe, and I look forward to spending this evening with you. Over to you, Anna. Good evening, everyone. On behalf of my colleagues at TD, I am thrilled to join you this evening for the TD Walter Bean Professorship, public lecture, and to hear from Dr. Julian Ajuman. TD recognizes the importance of education and the environment, and we're so proud of the longstanding relationship between TD and the University of Waterloo. In addition to the TD Walter Bean Professorship in Environment founded in 1992, in, in 2003, TD established the Graduate Scholarships in the Environment with an endowment to the University of, Water, of Waterloo. And in 2011, we created the TD Graduate Bursaries in the Environment. At TD, our purpose is to enrich the lives of our customers, our colleagues, and our communities. And that is why in 2018, we launched the TD Ready Commitment, our corporate citizenship platform aimed at building toward a more inclusive and sustainable tomorrow. This includes a $100 billion target for low carbon lending, financing, asset management, and other programs by 2030. TD was the first bank in North America to become carbon neutral in 2010. And we're now the first bank in Canada to set the ambition of net zero emissions by 2050. Evolving TD's commitment to net zero emissions requires the removal of carbon from the atmosphere equivalent to the amount of carbon emitted. Like the University of Waterloo, our goal is to elevate the quality of our environment so that people and economies can, th can thrive. It is partnerships like this that allow us to deliver on our commitment. On behalf of my TD colleagues here tonight, and more than 400 TD employees in Waterloo Region, we say thank you to the University of Waterloo for your continued environmental and educational leadership in the world. And I'm so sorry that we could not all be together tonight, uh, that uh, we couldn't be in person, that we had to be virtually. But don't worry, next year we will be in person. I hope everyone enjoys the lecture and thank you again. Well, thank you very much, Sheridan and Minister Chagger and Anna for those, those wonderful remarks. Now, before I introduce our speaker, I just want all of you who are joining us tonight to know that you will be able to ask questions throughout the talk. So if you go to the bottom of your screen, you'll see the letters Q and A. And if you click on that, you'll be able to ask questions. Of course, we'll try to get to as many as we can and perhaps bundle some according to the theme. So that's your job for the night. 
My job right now, and I'm so pleased to do it, is to introduce our esteemed speaker, Dr. Julian Ajiman. Dr. Ajiman is a professor of urban and environmental policy and planning at Tufts University near Boston, Massachusetts. And he's the originator of the concept of just sustainabilities, the intentional integration of social justice and environmental sustainability. Born and trained in the UK, he has a Bachelor of Science in Geography and Botany from the University of Durham, a Master of Arts in Conservation Policy from Middlesex University, and a PhD in Urban Studies from the University of London. He identifies as a critical urban planning and environmental social science scholar. Dr. Ajiman believes that what our cities can become, that's sustainable, smart, sharing, resilient, just, and who is allowed to belong in them, recognizing difference, diversity, and a right to the city, that these are inextricably linked and that we therefore must act on both belonging and becoming, using just sustainabilities as the anchor. Julian has authored 12 books, including Just Sustainabilities, Development in an Unequal World, Cultivating Food Justice, Race, Class and Sustainability, and Shaping city, Sharing Cities, a case for the truly smart and sustainable cities. In 2018, he was awarded the Athena City Accolade by KTH Royal Institute of Technology in Stockholm, Sweden for his outstanding contribution to the field of social justice and ecological sustainability and planning. In his talk tonight, Julian will outline the concept of just sustainabilities as a response to the equity deficit of much sustainability thinking and practice. And he'll explore with us his contention that who can belong in our cities will ultimately determine what our cities can become. And he'll illustrate his ideas with examples from urban planning and design, urban agriculture and food justice, the Minneapolis paradox, and the concept of sharing cities. I am so delighted, Julian, that you've been able to join us today as the 2020 T.D. Walter Bean Professor in the Environment and to present your public lecture, Just Sustainabilities and Urban Planning, Policy and Practice. And I know that everyone on the call is welcoming you as I am in this virtual kind of way. So thank you so much for being with us tonight. Thank you, Dean. Thank you, President. And thank you, Janice Barry, for uh, nominating me for this uh, this fantastic um, honor, basically. Uh, I'm very honored to do this. And I'm just now gonna share my screen and I'm gonna speak for around 45, 50 minutes and then looking forward to questions. So my talk is called Just Sustainabilities uh, in Urban Planning, Policy and Practice. Before I start though, I want to offer a land recognition. I'm sitting here in Cambridge, Massachusetts and I'm on the land of the Wampanoag and the Massachusetts people. And I wanna pay my respects to their elders, their past, their present and their future and commit to a principle of respect and care as a part of this meeting. So let me give you a little bit of history about this idea of just sustainabilities. Why just sustainabilities? Why not simply sustainability? Well, as, um, as the Dean mentioned, I've been very concerned for the last 20, 25 years that when we talk to people, if we went out onto the streets of, of Waterloo, of Kitchener, and asked 10 people, what is sustainability? Nine out of 10, or maybe even 10 out of 10, would say, well, it's about the environment. And of course it is about the environment, but I could also think about us regulating for a green world, but it could still be socially unjust. Is that sustainable? So really what we picked up on in this book that you see here, and I am advertising books folks, so get on Amazon and start buying. Um, in this book, we broke new ground because we understood that there is an equity deficit in much sustainability thinking. Mm -hmm. Usually you'll get a sustainable development book and there'll be one chapter on equity and justice. That's not good enough. Equity and justice permeate the idea of sustainability. 
And what I want to really get you to think about is that this book focusing as it did on equity and justice was really focusing on the links between environmental equality and human equality. Too often our social movements are environmental movements or they are social justice movements. We have Greenpeace and Friends of the Earth and then on the other hand we have the social justice organizations, the human rights organizations, Amnesty International. I would argue that we've actually failed on environmental quality and human equality because we've separated them out. Now that's not always been the case. If you think of uh, some of us who are old enough, I can think back to when Chico Mendes was killed in the Brazilian Amazon in 1988. Um, and I was in London and Friends of the Earth said, oh my God, the rainforest campaigner, the green campaigner, Chico Mendes has been killed. Well, we knew actually that he wasn't simply a rainforest campaigner. He was also a social justice advocate. He was the leader of the Brazilian rubber tappers union. And he understood that the integrity of the Amazon ecosystem affected the livelihoods and jobs of those rubber tappers. He was both. And I want to put it to you that in the global north, we are very reductionist. Oh, I'm an environmental campaigner. I'm a social justice campaigner. No, we're not. We should be campaigning for the integrity of human lives and the environment. So what we were arguing in this book essentially was that sustainability cannot simply be seen as a green or environmental concern, vitally important though green and environmental issues are. But we said that a truly sustainable society is one where wider questions of social needs and welfare and economic opportunity, as, uh, as the president said, and economic opportunity are integrally related to environmental limits imposed by supporting ecosystems. So this has to happen, this enterprise called human development has to happen within environmental limits. And we were very uh, careful to uh, not be seen simply as social justice campaigners, but as people who wanted to uh, improve social justice within the context of environmental limits. Now, I don't usually advertise other people's books, but I want you to read this book. It is a fantastic book by Wilkinson and Pickett, two British researchers. And really, here's the headline. It's not poverty, it's inequality that is corroding our quality of life for both rich and poor. In this book, they gathered 40 years of empirical data from around the world. And what they were looking at was the gap between rich and poor. And they found that countries with a bigger gap between rich and poor had many, many, many more social malaises from uh, greater incarceration rates, to drug abuse, to domestic violence, to teen pregnancies, you name it, it increased with the increasing inequities in our society. Two things were very important though. They did something that was quite remarkable, I think. They decided to try and correlate advertising revenues with inequality. And they found that countries that have greater inequality have higher advertising revenues, much higher, because inequality sells. People who are poor want to get into the middle class, the middle class into the upper, the upper into the rich, the rich into the super rich, the super rich into the I'm Jeff Bezos class. That's what we do as humans, we try and better ourselves. So their point, which I've highlighted here in yellow, was that inequality heightens competitive consumption. Now let's think about that, competitive consumption, keeping up with the Joneses. What does competitive consumption also drive? It drives our carbon footprint. There is a correlation between inequality and carbon production. How often do you hear um, climate change campaigners talking about inequality as a driver of climate change? We're always told, oh, we need sustainable transportation, we need sustainable agriculture, and of course we do. But if we wanna look at drivers of climate change, inequality is a major driver. So I want you to understand, if we want to think about sustainability, our focus should be on both human equality and environmental quality, not separately, but together. And I think this word in the social sciences we use now is intersectionality. There are so many intersectionalities between human equality and environmental quality. So let me just define 
just sustainability is the need to ensure a better quality of life for all now and into the future in a just and equitable manner while living within the limits of supporting ecosystems. And there are four conditions. We must commit to improving people's quality of life and well-being. We must commit to meeting the needs of both present and future generations. We must see justice and equity in terms of recognition, process, procedure and outcome. And I just want to dwell on that word recognition. Increasingly, there are cries in our society for recognition. The best example at the moment is Black Lives Matter. It is a cry for recognition. It is a cry to say we belong, we matter, me too no more guns. All of these moves for identity and recognition I think are important because if we do not recognize the rights to be of certain groups in society, how can we ever do justice by them? How can we ever reconcile difference, uh, etc.? And I'm going to go on to unpack that more as we go on. Now all of these three first conditions must take place within ecosystem limits, the so-called one planet living principle. And I just had to throw in here that just sustainability predates uh, Kate Raworth's brilliant idea of donut economics, which for those of you who don't know, Kate really took Rockstrom's work on ecological ceilings, uh, arguing that we cannot bust through the ecological ceiling, although we have on climate, on, uh, on, on phosphate pollution, on biodiversity loss. But she also said, look, it's not just about providing a ceiling above which we must not grow in terms of environmental pollution. We must have a social foundation below which we must not let people fall. And that social foundation could be based on issues like social equity, gender equality, political voice, etc. So between the ecological ceiling and the social foundation is the safe and just operating space for humanity. That's where just sustainability is. <clears throat> and Kate and I have talked about the similarities between our ideas. And then, of course, all of this relates to the sustainable development goals. I'm so pleased that in 2015, the UN acknowledged explicitly the need for uh, equity and social justice to really permeate uh, sustainable development and sustainability thinking more generally. Now, um, as uh, was mentioned, I'm a critical urban planner, a critical environmental social scientist, and I want us to think of a couple of thoughts about urban planning, because my examples are largely going to be from urban planning. First, I want us to think about urban planning as managing our coexistence in shared space. A wonderfully simple idea. Managing our coexistence in shared space. Coexistence, shared space. That's what urban planning is. How do we uh, do that in um, environmental, transport or other conflicts when what we have to realise is we live in cities of difference. We, we share this planet with people who are very different to us. We need to find ways of coexisting in these shared spaces from the next door neighbour to the street to the neighbourhood, the city, the region and finally the world. Managing our coexistence in shared space. Second, I want to think about, uh, as the Dean mentioned, what is the relationship between belonging and becoming? Because my profession, urban planning, we're very good at dreaming about futures. We think of all the famous urban planners from Jane Jacobs, uh, you, you know, uh, way back into, into uh, um, urban planning history. Urban planning has always been about dreaming about a better place. And I don't want us to stop doing that. But in thinking about what we are becoming, I think we are overshadowing a more necessary conversation every day, a more necessary conversation into the future, which is about belonging. Who gets to belong in our cities? We are increasingly denying belonging, whether it's to homeless people, whether it's to um, people um, moved out by gentrification, people displaced by gentrification. Let's try and balance our attention on belonging and becoming. And then I want to take a little bit of a pot shot at the, the new urbanists who talk about human scale planning. Absolutely, let's talk about human scale planning, but I want us to put an E on the word human. I want to see humane scaled planning, and you'll see why as I go through my examples. And my examples are, I'm going to talk a little bit about spatial justice. 
how do we allocate rights in urban spaces and places? People don't experience space and place uh, in similar ways. It is gendered, it is racialized, it is sexualized. There are many ways to experience place and space. How do we allocate rights to urban spaces and places? I wanna talk about the Minneapolis paradox. Many of you be thinking, what, what's he thinking about Minneapolis paradox? Well, here's the paradox. How does one of the most green and liberal cities in the US end up as the epicenter of our current introspection over structural racism? And then I want to finish up uh, by giving an example from food justice. And I want to ask a very simple, but I think provocative question. What is local food in intercultural societies? What is local food in intercultural societies? So let me start by uh, talking a little bit about spatial justice. And here you have a city, Jerusalem, with a wall. Very few cities actually have walls separating populations now. Um, Belfast used to in Northern Ireland, Nicosia in Cyprus. But the point is that you don't need walls. In US cities especially, there might be a freeway, a railroad track, a creek or river. And on one side they live and on the other side you live. Their life chances are much less than yours. Their life expectancy is much less than yours. Their opportunities are much less than yours. So this idea of spatial justice really takes its cue from social justice in saying that life chances shouldn't be distributed along class lines, but nor should they be distributed geographically. About two miles from where I live here in Cambridge, Massachusetts, I could go to a neighborhood that looks very different to my neighborhood. And when there's ever a shooting in Boston, we know where it's going to be. We know that we've concentrated poverty, uh, neglect, lack of opportunity in certain neighborhoods. How do we make our cities more spatially just? And let me just bring this down to a very simple urban planning idea about streets. Two streets here. On the left, we have Gothenburg in Sweden. On the right, we have Massachusetts Avenue in Cambridge. These streets are identical width, but they couldn't be more different. On the left, the Swedes have imposed spatial justice on the street. They have given everybody equal rights to the street, whether you're a cyclist, a uh, streetcar rider. And to the left of the streetcar, you can see maybe five, ten percent of the street is given over to a place where private vehicles are allowed. Flip over to the right side and you'll see Massachusetts Avenue. That's organized chaos. And basically the principle of rights to space on American roads and Canadian roads is a, having a vehicle, B, the size of your vehicle. The bigger the vehicle, the more rights you have. Question for you, and I'm not gonna answer this question, but for a PhD, this would be a great piece of research. How are young kids wired differently growing up on each of those two streets? On the left, they see order, they see a democratized space. On the right, they see anger, road rage, pushing, shoving to get the car into a certain space. How does that affect a kid's wiring? Now we do have some data from uh, work that was done uh, in San Francisco in the late 70s, early 80s. Um, and basically, you can see here on heavily traffic streets, moderately traffic streets, lightly traffic streets, there are very different uh, opportunities for social interaction. On the heavily traffic street, there's much less social interaction across the street and people have fewer acquaintances, fewer friendships. That's not so on the lightly trafficked streets. The lightly traffic street is what we call traffic calmed. Cars have slowed down, there's probably bump outs in the road, et cetera, et cetera. Now, what's the just sustainabilities issue here? Who lives in the neighborhoods with heavy traffic? Who uh, gets knocked over? who gets killed at higher rates, it's those groups of people from um, lower income and minority uh, groups. So just bear that in mind as, as we go along. Not everybody has the same neighborhoods. Neighborhoods are very different and this is an issue uh, in urban planning. Now, here's some good news. Uh, during the Bloomberg administration in uh, New York, uh, Mayor Bloomberg hired a brilliant transportation commissioner called Janet Sadiq Khan. She um, 
brought in a guy called Jan Gale, who was the mastermind behind the Copenhagen miracle. And this is what New York looks like at the bottom right today. Um, well, not today because of COVID, but that's what it can look like in summers. That's Broadway outside of Macy's. That's a people street. We can do this. But what I also want you to think about when you think about this slide is urban planning should not be about what is probable, but what is possible. We need to start thinking about what is possible. And again, the president said, do we have time? Um, you know, we don't have much time. We can't keep doing what we've done. We need to think about what is possible, what is needed, and to do that. Just to give you a few examples here, though, of how we deny belonging to certain people, whether it's the skateboarders wanting to jump up on that ledge at the top left, whether it's the homeless people who are denied uh, lying down on benches because we put armrests on them, the egregious studs that architects put on buildings to stop homeless people sleeping on them, the rich doors and the poor doors where um, the rich go in their super speed elevators up to their penthouses and the poor who are uh, legally in these buildings because of uh, zoning and, um, and, and um, uh, other regulations, the poor going through the back door, whereas the rich going through the, the front door. And then the most egregious of all in many ways is on the bottom left. That's a, uh, a bridge, uh, a road bridge in Seattle. And you can see that the city put bike racks there. They put bike racks there to stop homeless people sleeping there. Now, thankfully, the Seattle biking community said, whoa, that, what's this? We don't want uh, you to use sustainability infrastructure, bike racks, to deny homeless people the right to be here. Seattle, we have a problem. We need a policy-based solution, not uh, a defensive and hostile uh, architectural solution. Now, one friend of mine, Elijah Anderson at Yale University, sociologist, has come up with an idea uh, that I think is very interesting. He, uh, as a sociologist, as a, a street ethnographer, he calls himself, he looks at um, how people react to each other in urban spaces. And he's noticed that for most of the time, people wander around studiously trying to avoid eye contact. But he said there are certain places, and he calls them cosmopolitan canopies, where we are civil, we let our guard down, we talk. Many of these spaces are food spaces, and his example and the picture on his book is the Reading Terminal Market in Philadelphia. It's a space where people come, they eat, they sit in diverse groups, they talk about food, they talk about sports on the TV. Question, is there a role for us as urban planners and urban designers in creating cosmopolitan canopies? Surely a, an aim of urban planning should be to create these spaces where people can meet across difference and talk. And there is a theory here called contact theory. Contact theory works like this. The more chances you have to meet people who are different to you in convivial surroundings, the more likely you are to be tolerant, empathetic, supportive of policies that integrate different groups of people. Food spaces, kid spaces, and as a recent dog owner, dog spaces are great places for people to meet across difference. Can we do that as urban planners? Now, one of the solutions that is being pushed uh, in the US uh, is called Complete Streets. Let's break down this spatial injustice on streets by making streets people streets. Um, and there's a whole movement with its design manuals, with its policies, um, there's activist groups, there are, um, you know, professional urban planning groups, and here's some examples of some of their design manuals. Uh, the one on the, the right is from Toronto. So everybody has these, everybody's doing it. But, of course, as a critical urban planner, I want to know what is a complete street? Because on the bottom right there, you have an urban designer's design, and then on the left, you have a social ecology of the street. We can't design that street on the left. That street, I mean, the physical, yes, we can, but the social has come about 
over years of people interacting. And I want to invoke here Doreen Massey, the great late, sadly late geographer, Doreen Massey. She says places, and I see streets as places, um, as having no meaning. They are constantly shifting articulations of social relations through time. But tell that to an urban designer who's really just thinking about that cookie cutter design. That person is not necessarily bothering about the social ecology of the street. Now, Los Angeles, not many people think of Los Angeles in terms of complete streets because Los Angeles is about freeways. Los Angeles is, you know, motor capital of the US, but the city does have a complete streets policy and is pursuing it. However, and this is to my question, what is a complete street and who gets to say what is? Until very recently, LA banned street food vending. Now, two of the biggest minority groups in LA are Southeast Asians and uh, people from Latin America, whose culture is predicated on street food. How do you say you have a complete streets policy when you're denying a cultural um, and livelihood uh, of some of these, these people who do this? Now, luckily, uh, about a year ago, the uh, city of LA rescinded its ban but not for the complete streets reason. They did it because they didn't want uh, Trump's uh, ICE enforcers to come in and start taking people away because they're doing something illegal. So it's now done, it's now allowed on a permit basis. But it just shows you what is a complete street, who gets to decide. One book series that I edit is called uh, the Routledge Equity, Justice and the Sustainable City series. And uh, as you see on the left, uh, one of my books is called Incomplete Streets, because again, I always take the, the critical approach. And I'm not saying complete streets as a concept is wrong, but I'm saying it's incomplete in the absence of the other narratives of the street, of this idea of the social ecology of the street. And one of my worries is that these complete streets neighborhoods, as we saw in one of the slide, where you know, it's, it, you, there's much more opportunities for interaction and socialization. It's expensive. Rents go up, house prices go up once the complete streets treatment has been applied. And so in many ways, we argue that we are systematically reproducing the urban spatial and social inequalities and injustices that have characterized US cities for the last century or more. So in the past, it was redlining our cities. Redlining was where um, literally red lines were drawn on maps around neighborhoods where there was diversity, especially African-American, Asian-American, other groups, and people were denied loans. That was redlining. What we're now calling greenlining is these green neighborhoods which are increasingly white neighborhoods. And if you want to read about that, the book Green Gentrification, talks about urban greening as urban whitening. So again, we have a difficulty here because something that is good, we want green neighborhoods for everybody, but in the US, it's about opportunity to purchase into a green neighborhood, which means it's a socioeconomic calculus, which in the US is roughly um, correlated with issues of race and equity. And just to really nail this point home, uh, as if I need to, um, there is a measure of um, the walkability of neighborhoods. And I would argue that it is the key metric of urban sustainability is walkability. How walkable is your neighborhood? Because how walkable it is says a lot of things about safety, security, etc. So there is an app, of course, because there's an app for everything. There's an app to measure walkability. It's called WalkScore. Who owns the app? Redfin, which is a massive online realty company in the US. Let's just stop there. Sustainability, the key metric, walkability, is owned by, if you like, through the app. The measure, measurement of urban sustainability, walkability, is, is, is owned by Redfin, a realty company. How could it be any different than that, you know, walk score has become this very contentious idea Realtors will put it on a description of a house. You go to buy a house, you're in a walk score 95 neighborhood. That, that sells. So sustainability, I think, has been commodified uh, and 
uh, compromised in many ways as a result of this. Um, we can also think about other urban spaces in terms of spatial justice, urban parks. Excellent book here by my good friend, uh, Seth Lowe at CUNY in, uh, in New York. She says, in this century, we're facing a different kind of threat to public space, not one of disuse, but of patterns of design and management that exclude some people and reduce social and cultural diversity. I would actually argue it's not just the design and the management, it's also the programming of park activities. Who gets to do those things? Who, who, who designs, who manages, who programs parks? Do those people look like or even understand the communities in which they are designing, managing and programming parks? I, um, and if I had more time with you, I would love to talk a little bit about some research I'm doing on co-production. How do we co-design, co co-manage and co-program parks with communities? Imagine that. Wouldn't that result in a better use of space, more inclusive space? In Boston, um, we have now a majority minority city. And uh, next year, we will have, well, in fact, actually, we're going to have our first uh, female and first black mayor, uh, because Marty Walsh, the current mayor, has been taken by the Biden admi administration as the uh, Labour secretary. So there will be an interim mayor, and then there'll be mayoral elections in November, at which two women of colour are standing. We have a new Boston politically, but yet some of the old friends of organisations they don't look like the new Boston. These are empowered people, wealthy people, people who have access to funds. What happens when a city politically changes and yet some of the old established organizations don't change? That's a really interesting uh, thing to think about. And if we think about this even further, let's think about some of those immigrants to Boston. Um, how can we engage them in landscapes, in the cityscape? How do we do that? Well, in many ways, they are voting with their own feet. Um, this is a quote from a Guatemalan American in Boston. He says, I think one of the reasons we like that place, uh, and it's so popular with us Latinos, is because of the willows. Willows in Guatemala are very common. They grow beside rivers. People like Herta Park in Boston because it looks like home. And Herta Park is on the, on the Charles River in Boston. Immigrants gravitate to familiar places. And I'm going to come back to this when I talk about food as well. So I think here is a possibility for us in terms of involvement. In Copenhagen, they did it differently. Uh, Super Keelan Park is in the heavily immigrant Norrebro neighbourhood. And the designers worked with the community to find out okay, how do we make an inclusive space? And people said, simple, let's have architects from all of our cultures represented in this space. And so you can see it and it is, I've been there, it is a, a joy to go to somewhere where intentionally designers have thought about cultural inclusivity. Beyond all of this, demographics, oh, that neighborhood is 20% Latino, that neighborhood is, 10% African-American, that doesn't work. We need deep ethnographies. We need to understand not just the demographics, but the ethnographics of neighborhoods. And again, what a brilliant opportunity to co-produce. Imagine a local planning department working with the community to produce and keep up to date a deep ethnography. Through deep ethnographies, we can understand about cultural proclivities as regards public spaces and uh, other issues of urban planning. And I want to refer you to a brilliant article, which is in the journal that I edit. It's called Ethnographic Understandings of Ethnically Diverse Neighbourhoods to Inform Urban Design Practice. We have the information. There is no excuse for doing designs and design work that isn't really in tune with local people. And for those of you who are more interested in this, uh, I do urge you to go to the University of Sheffield's web pages um, in, in the UK, the Department of Landscape, there is a transnational urban outdoors research group, and they're doing this great work, Refugees Welcome in Parks, looking at ideas, how can parks be made more um, um, 
amenable for refugees. We know that it helps their well-being, and if there's anybody who needs uh, help with well-being, it's going to be people like refugees. Let me move on to the Minneapolis paradox. It's a green utopia, didn't you know that? It's got the best park system in the US, uh, based on the Trust for Public Lands Park Score Index for the last 10 years. It's one of the best cities in the US for exercise. It has the third most bike commuters. It's a miracle. No other place mixes affordability, opportunity and wealth so well. Only one problem here, that applies if you're white. If you're not white, racial inequality in Minneapolis is among the worst in the nation. Um, the black white income gap, how much people are paid, is the second highest in the nation. The wealth gap, the intergenerational wealth gap based around home ownership is the second highest in the nation. The opportunity gap or what some people call the achievement gap is super high between white kids, African Americans and Native Americans. So why is this so? Well, Kirsten Delagarde, who's a Minneapolis historian and founder of a, a very innovative project called Mapping Prejudice, she says all that civic rhetoric about Minneapolis being a, a model metropolis at the cutting edge of great urban planning obscures darker truths about the city. Well, let's think about what those darker truths are. Here, here's what they are. In the 18th century and up to the beginning of the 19th century, Minneapolis had a small but... Um, very well integrated African-American population. And then in the early 1900s, racialized covenants happened. These are um, legal documents which people sign before renting or buying a house. And some of the covenants said things like, this house must, be, uh, must not be uh, rented or sold to anybody other than the Caucasian race, uh, no mongoloid, negroid, Oriental, Turkish, I mean, horrifically racist uh, epithets here. But racialized covenants existed legally till the 1960s, but they still exist in people's minds. Add to that, uh, the US used racialized zoning until 1917, when it was struck down by the Supreme Court. And People thought, well, what are we going to do? We can't. So it's illegal to discriminate on the basis of race. Hey, let's use that other great tool that we have, socioeconomic wealth. So single family zoning came in, expensive houses, because people knew that many people on low incomes or minorities wouldn't be able to afford these houses. And 70% of the residential land in Minneapolis is single family. Plus redlining, this process that I've described to you about designating certain neighborhoods as not being fit for further mortgages, home improvement loans, bank loans, etc. What this means, covenants, single family zoning, redlining, is racial segregation then and now. And you know what, there's only one other country in the world that did it better than, um, that did it better than the US, and that's South Africa with the apartheid system. So what now? Well, Heather Worthington, who's director of long range planning for Minneapolis, acknowledges the direct link between those practices in the late 19th and early 20th century and today's modern zoning plans. And she acknowledges as part of, you know, a progressive green city that part of the impetus for change is to try and undo those impacts. I put it another way, very simply, urban planning is the spatial toolkit for articulating, implementing and maintaining white supremacy, and we can do something about it. So what are they doing in Minneapolis? They have a very bold plan called Minneapolis 2040. As part of that, in 2018, they were the first major US city to ban uh, exclusionary or single family zoning, and now they allow duplexes and triplexes on single family uh, zoned land. They've got inclusionary zoning, which requires new apartment projects to include at least 10% of units for low to moderate income households. But I think if you look at the number one uh, goal, eliminate disparities. In 2040, Minneapolis will see all communities fully thrive, regardless of race, ethnicity, gender, country of origin, religion or zip code, having eliminated deep rooted disparities in wealth, opportunity, housing, safety, safety and health. Excuse me. 
bold, bold, bold plan. But let me just give you one other little factoid. 93% um, of Minneapolis police don't live in Minneapolis, they live in the suburbs. Again, I come to this point, if your organization doesn't look like the community it serves, are you trusted? Are you legitimate? Are you effective? Now, I'm not saying Boston police are brilliant, but there's a residency requirement in Boston. If you're a Boston cop, you've got to live in Boston. There's a chance when you come to a de-escalation situation that you, somebody's going to say, that, that cop went to school with my brother, or do you know what I mean? There's a, there's a human element here. If you're busing in cops from the suburbs to bust heads in the inner city, that's not a good place to be. I, number one thing I would do if I were in the city of Minneapolis would be to have a police force that is more representative uh, of the communities. And so I want to finish up in the next five, seven, eight, nine, maybe 10 minutes uh, by thinking about food justice. And here's a, uh, another book opportunity here. If you're interested in food justice, uh, this might be of interest to you. So I posed that provocative question at the beginning. What are local foods in intercultural societies? And let me tell you the story of sadly the late George and his uh, still living wife, Julia Bowling. I was listening to National Public Radio and I came across this fascinating segment in 2011. They are tobacco farmers in Maryland. The state of Maryland is trying to get farmers to diversify out of tobacco. They started scratching their heads thinking, what are we gonna, what are we gonna grow? Um, they are good American entrepreneurs, and I give you this example to show that food justice isn't just about charity. So they started looking around and they realized that in the Washington DC metro area abutting uh, Maryland, there's about 120,000 Africans who are middle and upper middle class, um, diplomats, lawyers, doctors, surgeons, um, and they want to eat African food. They don't want it flown in, they want local, fresh African food. Maryland University, University of Maryland Extension Service steps in and helps the bowlings and the African community to find out what will grow in Maryland. They produce a nice booklet uh, about the cultural uses of the, the plants that are grown, about the, the recipes, etc. What are local foods in an intercultural society? Often I hear the alternative food movement saying, hey, you know, local food is what should be grown here. But I'm a geographer. There is nothing fixed about local. Local is, means nothing. It, it means what we can agree it means. There is no geographic integrity in the concept of local. But what I want to put to you here is that the Africans are thinking about translocalism or they're thinking about local as a cultural idea that we are here, let's bring our food here. The Guatemalans by the willows, familiarity is really important. The Filipinos in San Diego, again, use this concept of translocality. And when they were asked by the researcher who wrote this paper, they said, well, local food, it's, it's our food. It's the food we grow in our yards. It's the food we eat in Filipino restaurants. So this idea of, Translocalism of people bringing their local with them, I think is very, very powerful. In Canada, you have uh, a very interesting situation in Metro Vancouver. Not a lot of you will know this, but nearly 20% of the farmers in the greater Vancouver region are Chinese Canadians. And what's really interesting is they don't sell their food at the traditional farmers markets, the largely white middle-class farmers markets, they sell at a range of Chinese owned um, markets, roadside stores. And what was really interesting is that I, I gave this talk in Vancouver about 10 years ago and a young uh, East African woman came to me afterwards. She said, Julian, that's really interesting. I don't shop at the farmer's markets, I go to the Chinese markets because they grow the food that I want to eat. Now I just throw this out here as another aspect of food justice. The choice of immigrants to eat the kind of foods that they want to eat. And yet many in the alternative food movement still want to be didactic and say, oh no, this is what should be grown in Greater Vancouver. We have to be, I think, a bit more reflexive uh, in our ideas. Um, 
I also want to put to you that food justice is also a way of not just eating culturally appropriate foods, but growing them in a way that is redolent of where you're from. And these women are from Oaxaca in, uh, in Mexico. And I just think it's beautiful. I planted this garden because it's a little space like home. We grow the same plants that we grew back in our garden in Oaxaca. We can eat like we ate at home. And this meat makes us feel like a part of, uh, this makes us feel like ourselves. It allows us to keep a part of who we are after coming to the United States. The Filipinos, the Africans, the Guatemalans in Boston, the Oaxacans in South Central LA want to create meaningful space. And again, this is part of belonging and helping us to become intercultural cities. In San Diego and 50 other cities around the United States, there are farms like New Roots Farm in San Diego where refugees go to learn about American farming. It's an intercultural learning experience because they mix with uh, already practicing farmers and cultural learning takes place. I couldn't leave you without uh, finishing up with a, a photograph um, of the cover of my latest book, The Immigrant Food Nexus, Borders, Labor and Identity in North America. Three of the chapters are based on Canada. This is why I, I said identity in North America rather than the US. But really this book just looks at the increasingly important role of food in immigrant lives. Not so much in terms of nutrition, but in terms of the performativity, the uh, sense of identity, food as a, uh, a spatial practice. It really explores a lot of the other sides of food other than the molecular uh, and nutritional. So let me just summarize. We need to think about managing our coexistence in shared space. We need to foster belonging because I am convinced that our cities can become much better, more equal places uh, if we recognize the rights to be of more people uh, and those people have rights to the city. We need to foster engagement and belonging using deep ethnographic knowledge. We need to engage in intercultural, culturally competent planning and policy making. We need to practice humane scaled as well as human scaled urban planning and design. And above all, the message I want to leave you with is social justice never simply happens. It never simply happens and it probably never will. We've always had to take social justice. We've had to push for social justice. What, we, what this means in urban planning is we don't get to social justice. We start with ideas about social justice and we bake them in at the beginning of policy and planning processes. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Julie. And it was um, a fascinating uh, talk. You know, you gave me enough ideas about what I should be reading that I can read for all the rest of the COVID um, lockdown, I'm sure. So, so thank you. Some authors I know and some authors I don't. I think lots of people in the audience are excited about that. You know, I also appreciate the way you took us places, places that perhaps we miss going, but parts of places that we've maybe never seen or at least haven't seen in the way that you've helped us understand them. So, so thank you for that. Um, I, I think, you know, you've really been clear, I think, in getting us to understand what you mean by just sustainabilities. And I think you've also helped us understand that we have a role to play in everything that we do. And so, so thank you for that. We're going to have a bit of a fireside chat now and I'm going to invite uh, in a moment, Dr. Janice Berry, who's an assistant professor in our School of Planning to join you. And she'll also help to moderate the questions that have been coming in. But just a very quick introduction to Janice. So Janice began her career as a natural resource and protected area planner with the Ontario government, but she's been working for nearly 20 years in urban and regional planning. And her scholarly work is driven by a concern for how planning and decisions are made and how institutional structures either facilitate or impede meaningful engagement with diverse peoples and perspectives. And I know that she shares lots of thinking also with you, Julian. Now, much of her work in recent years has focused on conflicts and collaborations between indigenous peoples and settler planning agencies. And this is one of the richness of um, gifts, rich gifts that she really brings to our faculty to help all of us under, understand that as well. 
She's written numerous articles on these subjects and she has a 2016 book with Libby Porter called Planning for Coexistence, Recognizing Indigenous Rights Through Land Use Planning in Canada and Australia. So uh, Janice holds degrees from UBC and Trent. She's a registered professional planning and we're really happy that she's part of the University of Waterloo team. And so with that, I'm gonna pass it over to, to you, Janice. Thank you for that introduction, Jean. Um, so I've been following the, the Q&A while Julian's been speaking. Um, and Jean had mentioned my, my book title about coexistence. So this is uh, one of the interests that Julian and I share. And one of our attendees this evening um, who describes themselves as a, an immigrant youth, a UW alum, and a winner of the TD Ready Challenge, which is um, an, a challenge for entrepreneurs, um, also was struck by this idea of coexistence. And um, they wanted to hear a little bit more about your thoughts, not about a coexistence between um, sustainability and equity, although I'm sure they were captivated by that as well, but was interested in, in a coexistence of equity and this drive for excellence and entrepreneurial behavior and um, uh, for exception. So I'm wondering if you have comments on how we bring an equity perspective into entrepreneurship and this drive for excellence as well. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, not a question that I usually get. So uh, whoever the uh, the question raiser was, um, thank you for that. Um, I think back to issues of diversity. And if you look at what most cities do, cities often um, tolerate, research, moderate diversity. They don't celebrate diversity as such. You know, show me a North American city that has a sign like two Australian cities that I know of, you know, the multicultural city where they actually have that as part of their logo. No US city does that. We are very much, um, you know, that's very much in the background. But if you go to research in um, business journals, you'll see for the past 40 years, many or most uh, large companies realize that diversity is an asset um, and that, the coexistence of difference within businesses in R&D terms can actually lead to more um, um, innovative outcomes, um, to more, um, you know, to deeper penetration into markets that the company might not have got into. So I, I think we do have to decouple this feeling in many people's minds that, you know, that excellence should be just about choosing the right person, and, and that usually is the white male, uh, as opposed to this idea of equity and excellence as being, um, you know, two ideas that can work together. The lack of opportunity for some people is so great that we we forget that you know if we were to invest more in um, you know the opportunity gap, we would have many 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 more excellent people to choose from. Let's not just just choose from those. I, I mean, actually, let, let me just say it this way. I mentioned in terms of Minneapolis the the difference between um, the achievement gap and the opportunity gap. So in U.S sort of educational politics, there's this idea of the achievement gap. Why is it that African-American kids are doing so poorly um, and some other ethnic groups, Native Americans? That's not the question. The question is the opportunity gap. Why are they denied the opportunities for excellence? So again, I hope that helps your, uh, your, your, your question. It's all a question of where we draw the line. And if we draw the line at saying everybody is capable of excellence, I'm, then I'm good. But at the moment, we only allow or confer excellence on a certain amount of people who usually are from white, middle and upper middle class cultures. Great. Thanks, Julian. Um, and I did not put this question in the, the Q&A, but I'm interested in your answer. There was a person... Um, who made a plea for you to say a little bit more about co-production. You gestured towards it in your talk, and I say this wasn't me, because of course 
you and I have many conversations about co-production and have done some writing on it. Um, but I'm curious how you would relate this um, to, uh, to the Minneapolis paradox that you mentioned. You sure. talked about the possibilities of what urban planners can do. So how does co-production fit in to what planning and planners can do in the face of these inequalities? Well, great question, Janice. And uh, are you sure you didn't put it in? <laughs> Look, um, let's think about co-production. I mean, it's common sense in some ways that if we involve more people in doing something, that we're much more likely, not certain, but much more likely to get a, an outcome that is more suited to most of those people. Um, and let's think about co-production at two levels. Uh, when I moved to Cambridge, Massachusetts 20 years ago, the city was doing a tree planting scheme, street trees, and they slipped a note through your door asking you to pledge to throw a bucket of water over the tree every week in the hot summer. I helped co-produce a street tree and it's there and it's healthy and I'm very proud of that. That's the simplest level. Slightly more complex level of co-production, participatory budgeting that came out of Brazil, out of Porto Alegre. And now many cities in the US and Canada and around the world have participatory budgeting where communities and the city co-produce a budget. And here in Cambridge, Massachusetts, we've had some great innovative um, participatory budget uh, items like restrooms for the homeless uh, in Central Square here in Cambridge where I live and Central Square is right between MIT and Harvard you know you couldn't think of a more elite space but it, this is there's a lot of homeless people there it also resulted in sanitary protection for homeless women great ideas at another level co-production um, is being used in the health service. There's one hospital in Pennsylvania where <clears throat> when you're discharged with um, having had one of a number of procedures, you won't be followed up by a doctor, you won't be followed up by a nurse, you'll be followed up by somebody who's had the same procedure. Co-producing health. Guess who recovers best if you're visited by a doctor or nurse or by another person that's had the same procedure? Because that person can confer empathy, they can empathize with you. The results are off the charts successful. So there's some examples of co-production. There's a group called Nesta, N-E-S-T-A in the UK, if anybody's interested, they're really looking at blurring the lines between provider and user, between manufacturer and consumer. How do we do that? Because, you know, we're in a world where there seems to be less work at least we could start to investigate ways in which uh, we could bring more people into a productive ambit and their well-being would improve as a result. So I think co-production, <clears throat> I mean, it's, you know, we're at the beginning of thinking about this, but I think co-produced futures, co-produced parks, um, let's go to it. And in urban planning terms, this is, this is public participation on steroids in many ways. It's going further than just passive public participation. This is about co-producing the urban commons, if you like. Um, in your answer to that question, you've just talked about co-producing trees as a resident of Cambridge. And you've also drawn um, some examples of um, interventions that have been responses to kind of the hostile architecture that we see towards uh, homeless people in cities. We had a question about a phenomenon that's um, certainly here in Kitchener where I live, actually, I can think of one place just behind my house where this is done, where um, homeless people are setting up encampments in wooded areas, urban green spaces. And the response is, is to cut down the urban green space um, as a kind of not hostile architecture per se, but hostile urban forestry policies, I suppose, in a sense. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, so I'm wondering how you would fit that into your notions about um, spatial equality and just sustainabilities. Well, again, this has happened in, in Seattle. Um, Seattle Parks Department changed their management regimens to 
to oust homeless people in camping in parks. Look, we have a great problem with homelessness. Nobody can deny that. But what we need is robust policy solutions, not, um, you know, uh, sort of trigger solutions like cutting down trees or putting uh, bike racks under bridges where homeless people uh, live. These are petty. Uh, they show a disregard. They, they are inhumane, is what I'm saying. Uh, they are in, inhumane. It's not a way that we treat human beings. Remember the pictures of the studs that I showed on, on buildings to stop homeless people sleeping in the overhang and keeping warm, maybe, or, or dry. I mean, we, 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 at railway stations, we have little spikes to stop pigeons landing and things like that. How are we treating human beings in such a way. So we need policy solutions uh, and we need resources to deal with this issue, not um, cutting down trees or, uh, you know, other horrific things that we do to, to, to homeless and uh, unhoused people. We've of course um, talked tonight a lot about racial inequalities in cities. And one of the very early questions in the Q&A was, um, pondering um, whether when we talk about just sustainabilities or spatial equality, if sometimes we're sidelining issues of accessibility and thinking about how justice also needs to apply to persons with disabilities. I'm wondering if you could comment a little bit on um, the intersection between just sustainabilities and accessible cities. Yeah, that's a great question. And, and of course, you know, I can never in 45 minutes do justice to all of these issues but you know I should throw in um, some some more examples you know I use the word difference uh, quite a lot and difference to me you see because diversity in the US has become largely conflated with with minorities and, and gender um, so difference to me speaks to all these forms of human difference um, whether they are ability uh, disability based or sexuality based or racially, ethnically, gender. Um, but but yes, I so the accessible city, I mean, I've been thinking about this a lot recently because I'm doing a, a paper at the moment on active transportation, which is walking and cycling and social justice, because clearly some neighborhoods are not as walkable and cyclable. And what really is, quite alarming to me is how many urban planners, transportation planners, keep talking about mobility as if mobility is a goal. The goal is accessibility using mobility as the means. But yet many urban planners still talk about mobility. <laughs> what do they want? People just moving around all the time? No, we want people moving around to places which they can access. So I think issues of accessibility, are really, really important, and especially for those people with, with physical um, disabilities. And I'll just finish on this point. There's a great paper by a woman called Angela Glover Blackwell, who was the CEO and founder of a US organization called Policy Link. And she wrote this brilliant policy memo called the curb cut effect. I don't know whether people have heard of this, but her point was that before the Americans with Disabilities Act, you know, uh, the, the idea was, uh, how do we get people with disabilities, um, mainly mobility disabilities, how do we get them to move around cities more easily? And so we talked about curb cuts and now any road improvements in the US have to include, um, you know, uh, ADA compliance. But it was suddenly realized that actually this curb cut effect was much more about good planning for everybody, because it wasn't just people with disabilities. It was, you know, the the, the, the pregnant mother, the, the 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 person with a stroller, the student pulling a large uh, wheeled um, suitcase along, uh, the delivery worker trying to get at the hump to deliver stuff to the store. So the curb cut effect has become this idea of when we do something good in equity planning it generally benefits many more people than just the intended audience. I think it's a, a great idea. I, I just want to acknowledge that we have a ton of questions in the Q&A and, and not a ton of time. Um, so apologies to everyone if you've been submitting questions and comments if we can't get to them. 
But there's one question here that I did want to get to. Um, as Waterloo's president and as, as the dean um, expressed in their opening remarks, we have alumni all over the world, many of whom who've joined tonight in various time zones. And of course, we've talked a lot about the Global North tonight and, and planning in cities in the Global North. But there was a question or a, a request if you might have some comments about planning in the Global South or in developing um, cities and developing contexts. Yeah, OK. Um, so I never really explained why I use the plural just sustainabilities as opposed to just sustainability. And it's precisely because of what your questions are asking. I don't want to be prescriptive and say this is the cookie cutter just sustainability, because whether you're in Birmingham, Alabama, Bangalore, India or Berlin, Germany, uh, sustainability will look very different. Um, and what I have to say is um, the countries that I've actually looked at most in terms of sustainability have been um, Latin American countries. Um, if you look at, for instance, you know, one of the earliest examples of um, sustainability planning was, um, and I'm, oh, Curitiba, Curitiba in Brazil with its revolutionary bus rapid transit system. Uh, if you look at Belo Horizonte in Brazil, that has the world's most advanced food security system. Uh, if you look at Medellin, Colombia, which uses the principle of social urbanism to invest mainly in low income neighborhoods that have been starved of funding. If you look at Porto Alegre with its participatory budgeting. But what's really interesting is here, these mayors who in instigated these schemes, A, these weren't mayors who just juggled between the unions and concerned citizens and, um, you know, and, and, and developers. These were mayors who had a philosophy. And that philosophy was bound around social equity. So many of the examples that I find of sustainability that are going on in uh, places in the global south have their roots in equity. But what they do is it benefits all people. So, for instance, the bus rapid transit in Curitiba, it was about accessibility. The mayor at the time wanted his citizens, the poorer citizens, to have access to the cultural resources and other resources of the city. But in doing that, it's almost like the curb cut effect, it had a green effect because it got people out of their cars. So I see in many ways the way that sustainability and just sustainability works in the global south there's more of a focus on social justice and equity in sustainability in the global south than say there is uh, in the global north maybe is one final question um and again thinking back to the honorable burgers chat as uh, the minister's um comments about the pandemic there's been a little chatter in the q a about um the idea of COVID and, and kind of building back better and the implications of COVID in terms of um, spatial equality and just cities. I wondered um, if you might leave us with some final thoughts on that. Yeah, great question. Um, so, <clears throat> you know, let's just take a moment to remember the horrific uh, toll that this, um, this pandemic has taken uh, around the world. And you know, we know who it's hit first and worst. Um, but the other side of it is that people are rediscovering public spaces. People are rediscovering what it's like to see streets that are not choked with cars and that have more and more cyclists. And I like the idea that many cities from Oakland, California, to Milan, to London, to Boston, all around the world, many cities are taking advantage of this public support and are mainstreaming some of their more progressive spatial justice type policies and urban planning type policies. Can we maintain that? Just one, one thing going back to the person who was asking about issues of disability. I mean, so I was reading something recently about how a lot of cities around the world are now allowing restaurants, bars to, uh, you know, to go beyond their property line and have a few tables on the street. 
we might think this is great for economic development and helping these struggling businesses, but one particular group of disabled people, the, the, the partially uh, or, or unsighted group, have been finding it a real problem because the streetscape has all of a sudden got a lot more messy. Um, so again, what we have to think about in just sustainability terms is how do we mitigate against these downsides we do need to help the restaurant owners we do need to help the business owners but in doing that we cannot compromise the safety uh, and security uh, of you know a vulnerable group in society so you know i i think this is a time to co-produce our post-pandemic future great thank you i think that's a wonderful note to leave on i i see we're right at the time for a q a um, so again, apologies if we didn't get to your question, um, but thank you for submitting your questions. They were all thought provoking and uh, I'm sure Julian will review them after the talk and, and um, see your wonderful comments that you were making in the Q&A. Um, so with that, I'll turn the floor back over to Dean Andre. Okay, thank you very much. And um, I think we're gonna have all of uh... Our, our, our panelists sort of come back on, all the speakers, just so that we can acknowledge them again. And uh, I, I just wanna again, thank TD for all of your support over, over a good many years. I mean, I, this is the seventh I've had the pleasure of hosting and it's just, it's just so much fun and it's just such a wonderful partnership. So thank you so much. And Minister Chagger, you're always fantastic at coming out and supporting us. Yes, I know you're one of our Waterloo's and so, uh, but we feel your love. And so thank you very much for always coming out. And, and thank you, of course, to the uh, Waterloo team, uh, you know, Janice, obviously, for your expert asking of questions, our president for, for coming out, the folks behind the scene, uh, Miriam and her team and, and Angle, Angle Media and, and all of the folks. And of course, especially thanks to you, Julian, you know, I get really excited about the 17 sustainable development goals, but you're reminding me that these things are interconnected and that it's not good enough to, to think about either social justice or environmental sustainability, we need to think about these together. And so, and so thank you so much for sharing that gift of hope is, is the way that I see it. And so with all of that, um, I'm just delighted that we were able to get together. I know there were many, many hundreds who were on the call. And Julian, I know you'll be back. We're very much hoping that this COVID business will start to settle down and that um, we'll be able to have you back and and some of us will be able to interact with you in person so um with that sort of have a good evening and, and again thank you so much yeah okay Great. thank you thank you